So what, uh, so what I want to do is something different. It's not that you're going to get up and dance a horror now. What you're going to think about is I'm going to put it on its head. This conference in which the organizers have spent so much time putting together, and I thank them, I'm very grateful for it, is not only, I think, to look at what the connection could be, but what the connection is. Latin, Jewish, Hispanic, Jewish, I suggest to you, has been going on in the Americas for 500 years. It's just not about conversos. So I also want to suggest to you that although this is a big leap, but I'm going to show you some data based on Ira Sheskin's last study of Jewish Miami two years ago, which looks at Sephardi behavior and shows that they're much more traditional than Ashkenazi. And so the question in part is that are these practices that we are seeing in fact something that if we had other markers through oral history, through folklore, through memory that could correlate to show in fact maybe that these people that we are calling conversos in various ways, if we had the right markers, might be delineated because Sephardi practice their culture, their traditions much more rigorously, rigorously than the Ashkenazi. So what I want to begin with is a little movie, I think there's a movie there, that I made based on my project, which is collecting audiovisual stories of the million Jews who were displaced in 1948. Sergio Della Pergola is the expert about this. One million Jews, 850, 800, whatever number he wants. Today, there are 20,000, 30,000, one generation gone. And we are trying to get those stories in the same way that Spielberg collected Holocaust stories. Because think of it, Jews in Iraq go back to the time of Jeremiah, go back to the time of the Babylonian Talmud, 150,000, 1948, three today. Libya, 1948, 38,000, zero today. Okay? You talk about Jewish heritage, Jerba, where they made the dye for the temple. Hardly any Jews anymore. We have to get those stories just as we get the stories of the Holocaust survivors. And we have to change the narrative of Jewish peoplehood so the Sephardi have a voice again. And so if any of you are Sephardi who left North Africa, the Middle East, or have parents or grandparents, do let me know because I want to interview them. And so one of the people I interviewed was Julia Glazer, who's here. She's from Egypt uh, and left in the 1950s. And what the beginning of this movie does, it's a short movie, four or five minutes, it'll talk, every, these people will talk about that their roots go back 500 years, that that connection is always there. And listen to the different countries they come from, please. Spain, they were from Spain, they were from 
the way from Spain, as well most of the Jewish people, and they're going to Italy. Okay, so we're now in Miami, Florida. That's where we end up with these people that have come from all over the place. Miami's become their home. Okay, so what you have here is the XL from, uh, from Spain, and you can see the Jews uh, going to various places. Iraq's not even on the map, but this is the dispersion. We go to uh, slide two. Okay, this is the explorers coming into the Americas. Let's go to slide three. This is Ponce de Leon coming to Florida in 1513. It's the oldest continuous city, St. Augustine, 1565. Okay? Uh, I just want to mention something about this. Um, somewhere in my notes because I want to move along here. Um, in on the um, 1991, on the eve of the 500th anniversary of Columbus arriving in the Americas, I asked Professor Eugene Lyons, a specialist in Spanish colonial Florida and the director of the St. Augustine Foundation, if he could navigate the data and ascertain if conversos came to Florida. In his view, the third Spanish governor of Florida, Pedro Menendez Marquez, 1577-1589 was a Murano. Just a scholar, not Jewish, in charge of the St. Augustine records, spent an enormous amount of time in the archives in Spain. Okay, let's go to slide four. Okay, here we have Jewish migration to the Americas. So, if you read books like Seymour Liebman, we know the Inquisition was already in Mexico City in 1528. We know that it was in uh, Colombia in the 17th century, etc. So we have Jews in the Americas. Okay, let's move on to slide five. So this is Florida, and what we know is that uh, in the Treaty of Paris in 1763, what happened was that um, uh, Florida no longer was Spanish, it became British for about 20 years. Places like Quebec no longer was French, became British, the Treaty of Paris, sort of, you know, the New World as it was called, they just switched territories. And Jews, Sephardi Jews, practicing Sephardi Jews, who lived in New Orleans because um, Louisiana became Spanish, moved over to Florida. So the earliest record we have of practicing Jews is coming to Pensacola, which is in the top left there. Sorry, not there, it's over here. Uh, Pensacola here in 1763. That's the earliest we have. But my argument, of course, is that in the 16th century, you have already conversos coming in for a period of 150 years. What's, let's move to the next slide. So the next slide you have is Moses Levy. His ancestors were Hispanic, Ibn Yuli. They had migrated post the expulsion edict of 1492 to Morocco. With changing political winds, Moses migrated to Gibraltar, changed his name to Levy, Ashkenazi, why Levy? Obviously part of the Levite tribe. In due course, he went to St. Thomas in the Caribbean and built up a business. And we, of course, know that St. Thomas has the oldest continuous synagogue in the Caribbean. In 1816, he hears about a real estate deal in Florida. Um, that's not new. We hear about this all the time. And he purchases 50,000 acres. And what's interesting is that why does he purchase this? He purchases, purchases it because in 1821 it becomes a territory and he wants to set up the new pilgrimage. He's a devout practicing Jew. He rigorously keeps the Sabbath, reads from the Torah. And he puts advertisements in the European press and New York papers so that um, 
people who are escaping, who need refuge, can come into his uh, new pilgrimage, a revolutionary uh, event in the history of American Judaism, the first Jewish communitarian settlement. Anyhow, what happens is that, it, you know, malaria, swamps, mangroves, it fails, Seminole War, Indian War, and uh, it gets burned down. But his son, meanwhile, his son, he becomes a legislator, and he is the George Washington of Florida. A Sephardi Jew is the first Jewish member of the Senate. And not only that, which is even more interesting, is that he does not keep the name Levy. He goes back and chooses his pedigree, his Hispanic Sephardi name, Ibn Yuli. And he's known as David Levy Yuli. Now, Anyone here grew up in Florida? Okay, did you learn this in your schools? Do we, anyone go to Jewish schools at all? Did you learn that the first Jewish senator was a Sephardi Jew from Florida? What is wrong with our Jewish curriculum? He was a senator before Judah P. Benjamin, who by the way, was also a Sephardi Jew. No one was talking Ashkenazi yet, by the way. So David ends up building the railroad. Next slide. And uh, he secedes from the Union in 1861. And he ends up um, uh, intermarrying. He marries the uh, uh, former governor of Kentucky, um, his daughter. Her name is uh, Nancy Wycliffe. And his Four children are all brought up as Christian, although David never converts. Um, now, if we can go to the next slide. In 2000, they ended up naming a county after him, and uh, there's a city named after him. But for the most part, it's because of Florida historical evolution in terms of heritage landmarks, nothing to do with his Jewish heritage. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. So, I'm not able to, um, I tried with when um, Chaim Beinart was alive to track this down. He was very helpful for, uh, to me. Um, and I could uh, begin uh, in, um, uh, 1640, and you can track the family history, um, uh, uh, and the family, everyone writes about it in his records, that uh, it's a, a Spanish family, but I, I can't get those few generations. And you can see it moves on. The next slide, there's Moses. Next slide. Uh, and there's Moses at the top, and then you see uh, Elias. And then you see um, his children, David's brother, and this is where we are today. Now, what's interesting about this, just conceptually, is that for conversos, what we're saying is they were forcibly converted, and what we're doing is saying, are they in any way Jewish today? What are the markers to identify them as Jewish? But what's happened? to the experience of Jews in the United States is totally the opposite. It isn't forced conversion. They're assimilating. 4% in 1960, 50% today. But the Sephardi are much less assimilating than the Ashkenazi. And what you have here is someone who takes his patrimony back, David, intermarries, and yet his children are uh, intermarrying and away from the faith. So let's try to take a look at sort of today, what's going on. Can we move to the next slide? So what you see is that in, um, this is uh, Irish Eskin 2014, that the number of uh, Hispanics, Jewish adults, the number of Sephardi, the number of Israeli, 
uh, what the numbers are in, uh, in total here. There's about 100,000 Jews in Dade County today. Uh, it peaked at about 275,000, 250,000, whatever, in uh, mid-1970s. So the, the uh, Sephardi population, or the Hispanic population, has grown from uh, 1960, roughly about 5,000, before the Cuban Jews came, 1958, to today being about a third, about 30,000 of the, um, uh, the 100,000. And when you look at this population, you start saying, okay, are they Hispanic? What makes them Hispanic? And how are they related to my study in terms of collecting stories of Jews from uh, North Africa, Middle East? Well, you just ask them. Cuban Sephardi originated in Syria and Turkey and sought a place where Ladino was a stepping stone to, in, to integration. Argentinian and Venezuelan Sephardi identify Spanish Morocco, example Tetuan and Tangier, as their home pre-1956 and chose South America because Spanish was their native language. Brazilian Sephardi turned to Portugal and have also mentioned the Ladino currency. Algerian, French, Moroccan, and Tunisian Sephardi uprooted in the wake of Charlie Hebdo in Paris often remark that they come to Miami because they also have knowledge of Spanish. And so you end up with these incredible hybrids, Argentinian, Sephardi, American, Damascan, Mexican, American, Egyptian, Brazilian, American, and more and more and more hybrids, all connected in some way because of Jewish practices. So can we go to the next one? So this tells you in Miami what Sephardi synagogues there are, sort of what their um, uh, memberships are in terms of numbers. Uh, the largest one, which is not uh, here because it's not in Dade County, is um, B'nai Sephardim, which is in Hollywood, which has about 800 members. Okay, next slide. So, here you, here you see Jewish households in terms of Passover Seder. You can see that the Sephardi celebrate more than the uh, non uh, Sephardi. That Hispanic Jews, that's Ashkenazi and Sephardi, celebrate more. Next one. Hanukkah, same thing. Next one. Uh, this, of course, becomes extremely important now because you can see it's nearly double in terms of actually doing things that aren't just Hanukkah. This is much more uh, commitment. And same with the Hispanic, it's double. Okay, next one. Now you're really getting to it when you get to kosher. <laughs> kosher, okay? Now, think of it. When you think of conversos, what are they doing? They usually light Sabbath candles. I mean, if you're going to think of something, a marker, and they don't eat pig. Now, I don't know how we can correlate this, but I'm just trying to tease you. So, what, is, what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to say that ethnic Jewish Hispanic identity has been instrumental in transforming the Florida landscape and more broadly, United States. Shared meanings, cultural heritage, and historical legacies are reintegrating. This conference is but one example of reconnecting roots, and thank you for letting me share with you.